Good morning. Welcome to the adult Bible class. I'm glad for those of you who are able to join us live and for those of you uh, who are streaming. I'm just going to push the volume down just a smidge on the front of the house here. It sounds a little, little aggressive for 9 a.m. Happy Mother's Day. I guess uh, pretty much everybody here had one, right? So we got something to be grateful about. Um, it is uh, week 10 of hermeneutics, and we are looking at uh, the book of Acts, and there are some particular things about the book of Acts that can make it challenging uh, and it can actually mislead us as we try to interpret and apply the book of Acts because uh, it is different from just about every other narrative type book we find in Scripture. And we'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. This week, um, as we mentioned, we're week 10. Uh, we'll be looking at a review. We're going to look at Acts as a genre where the Gospels were theological biography. Acts is theological history. And we're going to look at the two main audiences, the Jews and the Gentiles, and the two main characters, Peter and Paul, that Luke uses to tell that theological history uh, event. There are six main divisions in this book that kind of move the book along. And when you understand the movement that Luke was going for in the book, it helps you stay on track and not get uh, distracted by details that don't necessarily mean anything other than they're there to tell the story. Uh, vertical thinking, as Luke acts, is uh, that topic that we'll be talking about how uh, we stay in line with what Luke was trying to say. Uh, and then we look at it as a concept, as new covenant uh, narrative. And then finally, we have to answer the question, is Acts trying to describe um, is, it, is, it, is it just explaining normative practices for the church today? Is it simply describing what happened? Or is it prescribing things for us to do? Um, and the idea there, as we'll get to it, um, yeah, I'll, I'll wait until we get there to explain it. Uh, weeks one through nine, as I've mentioned as we've gone along, it takes longer and longer to review as we get further and further, so I need to scale back on what we do instead of reteaching each of them. So here we go. Quick review. Point number one, hermeneutics is a two-step process of, most importantly, understanding the original meaning of a text to its original audience, and then applying that meaning in the context of our lives today as we are illuminated by the Holy Spirit, which means we're convicted of the truthfulness and we're convicted of the purpose that that has in our life. Um, narr Old Testament narrative, Old Testament law, all poetry, uh, and the prophets were written using known literary forms. And we must respect that literary form if we're going to get the original meaning that's there. Otherwise, uh, it's just a free-for-all, and you're just applying your own meaning to the text, and you're not hearing from God. Uh, you're just making up your own story, and you're using the biblical text to tell that story. Uh, wisdom literature is descriptive of normative principles and includes books of exception, suffering for the righteous. Um, having relationship with God is the most important thing that allows you to enjoy the blessings. And the purpose of wisdom literature was not to give you promises from God, but rather to develop the character of the reader so that you would then walk in righteousness along with God's uh, desire. Gospels are theological narratives. They're, they're uh, biographies whose intention is to teach us about the person, the nature, the mission, and the finished work of Jesus and their special literary forms work in concert with that purpose. So again, when you're reading parable, when you're reading narrative irony, you have to respect the form of that literature to get the meaning uh, 
out of the gospel that the gospel writer, the evangelist, was trying to put in. That's the review. So let's pray and get into today's lesson. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that, um, that we have 2,000 years of history of interpretation of the New Testament uh, by your church, that we have uh, many cultures today that interpret your word. And, uh, and, and we can look at our presuppositions through that lens, Lord, and, and cast off wrong understandings that we read into Scripture and, and hear your voice. Father, now as we look at the book of Acts, I ask that uh, we would be able to um, cast off our presuppositions, uh, at least recognize them, Lord, and, and, and hear what you have to say and understand what you are teaching uh, in your word, Father, that we would draw close to you, that, that our love for you would grow uh, in the richness as you inspired Luke to write this book. And I pray this in Jesus' name. All right. Uh, so the definition of theological history that uh, Blomberg, Klein, and Hubbard uh, write is that it is a narrative of interrelated events from a given place and time chosen to communicate theological truths. A narrative of interrelated events from a given place and time chosen to communicate theological truths. And this is significant because it's not trying to tell the whole story. It's not giving us every detail. It's only giving us the events and the details that are important to move along that narrative. Uh, and there are different contents inside of theological history. The first is there are historical events and people. There are theological insights, and it is a story of action and adventure. Now, what does that mean to us? When we're reading the book of Acts, what difference does it make that there's actual historical events and people? What difference does it make that Luke is providing us theological insights? And what difference does it make that there's action and adventure in it? What, what, what care do we have for that? Well, uh, the implication of it is that we now have a backdrop, a setting, for most of the letters that are written. We know the issues that were going on in Corinth in part because of the book of Acts. We know when Paul was in Macedonia and Thessalonica and uh, Colossae. Colossae. We, can, we can understand the, the nature of the movement because of the book of Acts. We can understand when we open up something like uh, the Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, the heart that Paul had for the elders of that church. We read about them gathering together in that final trip that Paul had. So uh, when we get those uh, incredible chapters about love in Ephesians, we have a context to put it into as Paul loved that church. And by making this something that is uh, adventurous, that has action to it, it is fun to read. It's probably my favorite book in the New Testament because it's not just kind of dull, uh, drab, preaching at you sort of stuff. It's telling a, a, a good story. The overall outline of this history we find in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it reads, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we get the outline of the book. We get the background of the epistles. Uh, praxis means um, uh, practice, not like, well, I guess, yeah, like rehearsing what you do. It provides us a background of what the early church did. And it gives us details of what was going on. We just have to be careful as we read these, whether we say, I'm going to apply these practices that they had in our church today, or it was something that was just happening there. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the balance that we have to find. Um, there are two main audiences. This uh, particular next two slides, these come from the Grasping God's Word a book directly. Uh, put that citation in your notes. If you notice, in Acts 1.8, it said, 
Uh, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly how Luke laid this book out. He began telling how the Holy Spirit moved to send God's word and his spirit into Jerusalem. And then it goes out further from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, and finally uh, through Paul to the ends of the earth, the known ends of the earth, at least at that time. And Luke tells this story using two main characters. The first character he uses is Peter, and the second he uses is Paul. And when you look at the brilliance of how he laid this book out, you can see that he basically parallels Peter's life with Paul's life as Paul is bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And this isn't an accident. This is to show you that the same blessings and the same God that was given to the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, because they were the northern kingdom, right? They're, they're the other ten tribes. That's that same blessing and that same God that goes out, that same spirit that empowers the Gentiles. So as Peter's giving a sermon in Pentecost and so many are being converted, so too Paul does at Pisidian Antioch. As a lame man is healed by Peter at the temple, gold and silver have I none, but uh, arise and walk, he heals him. So too Paul heals a lame man. They're gathered together in prayer and a building shakes. The same thing happens with Paul in Acts 16. The rebuke of Ananias and Sapphira is mirrored by the rebu rebuke of Elimas. The, the healing by the shadow of Peter is paralleled by the healing of the handkerchiefs of Paul, showing it's not the person but the power of the Spirit. Laying on of hands occurs twice. Simon the sorcerer is rebuked. The Jewish sorcerer is rebuked by Paul. The resuscitation of Tabitha is, by Peter is paralleled by the resuscitation of uh, Eutychus. And interestingly, this one has a parallel in Luke's gospel. Remember Jairus' Jer daughter, Jesus went in and he uh, you know, spoke to her. He says, Ar arise and eat. That is in actually Aramaic, not Greek. The, uh, get up and eat. In Acts, the raising of Tabitha is the exact same Aramaic words. So it's meant to show that the same spirit that by which Jesus was working while he was uh, emptied of his godness um by choice, not his nature, but to, to walk in his human nature, he willingly emptied himself of the glory of being God. Well, the power of the Holy Spirit worked through Jesus just like it did through Peter, just like it did through Paul. Peter was released from chains. Paul had chains removed in prison. So how does, how does Luke tell this story? Well, Luke tells this story as a series of progression of the word of God throughout uh, this um, period. The first thing he does is, is uh, tell the story in Jerusalem. And, and we get to see where Luke, the narrator, kind of pauses six different times and, and, and regrounds us to let us know that was a, a movement. It's almost like a, uh, anybody listen to classical music? You know, with the violins and the cellos and stuff. Everybody's heard of classical music, right? Well, in classical music, the composer will create movements where he'll, he'll have a, a section that's kind of fast and then another, the, the allegro, maybe, maybe one where you get a soloist singing this aria. Uh, maybe one that slows down and it's meant to kind of calm you back down. You know, the excitement of the, the Middle Ages where they gathered together for orchestras instead of Super Bowls. Well, these, these movements are kind of parallel, or the idea of these movements are, are what Luke is doing. So in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, we get the first movement which says, And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Notice who the audience is. Jerusalem, the disciples of Christ, and the priests. All the way up through chapter 6, we saw Luke was concerned with showing 
the gospel getting to Jerusalem. If we go back to the slide, notice chapter 6 is in Jerusalem. So that chapter 6 verse 7, that summary statement sets right there as he then transitions his, his speech or his story, the theological narrative, uh, into um, beyond. So at, at chapter 9, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee. See, Luke's focus has shifted now from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Can you, can you recognize that second movement? Now it's not Jerusalem, but it's Judea and Samaria. And the third movement, but the word of God increased and multiplied. The next movement, 12, um, chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened by the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. This is going out into the ends of the earth. This is the crescendo. This is 1920. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. And finally, Acts chapter 28, verses 30 through 31, we read, He lived there, Paul, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense, Rome, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, and without hindrance. And that's it. The book ends right there. But the story, the theological narrative doesn't end because it, there, there's actually an organization called Acts 29. The, the continuing act of the Holy Spirit as the word of God goes into all the world. This, these last four kind of breaks were showing stages as the church was growing and growing and growing into all the world. And finally, it had reached what for them was the center of the world, the uh, most important city of all the cities, which was Rome. So by now, the word of God has reached the, the heart of all mankind, if you will. So uh, one of the things that is interesting about Acts is that unlike the Gospels where we had two, three synoptic Gospels, we could read Luke. And we could understand his emphasis because we could compare it with Mark and Matthew. We can read Mark and understand his emphasis, his concern with his theological biography. Well, with Acts, we don't have any other versions of the story, no, no canonical versions of the, the story of how the church moved. So we don't have the opportunity to think horizontally. We can't look at other, you know, Matthew's Acts of the Apostles or Mark's Acts of the Apostles. So we can't, we can't do this horizontal uh, look at it. All we can do is look at how Luke is trying to tell the story. And since he was the author, we can, we can understand the emphasis he had in his gospel and, and carry that forward into the book of Acts since it was the same author. We know what his main theological concerns were in his gospel. And so now when we get to Acts, when we look at what's going on, we can translate or carry over his theological emphasis into what we're reading. Uh, pericope, which is here, this means a, a short section of a story. Like if you were going to tell somebody about the day that you had uh, today on Mother's Day with your family. You might talk about the drive down to Roanoke where you gather together or Lynchburg where you gather together, wherever it went. That drive story, that would be a pericope. And then you'd say, then we had lunch. And you'd tell somebody about the, the time you had together at lunch. That time together at lunch would be another pericope. Then you could talk about the drive back or the afternoon walk. So these little sections of stories that we read in Luke, we can see the same theological emphasis that Luke had in his gospel uh, carried over. We know that in Luke's gospel, he was more concerned with the outcast, the tax collector, the sinner, the woman, the, um, the Samaritan, than the other two gospel writers were. In Acts, we're going to see that same thing happen. We can see that um, Luke's emphasis in his gospel is on the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, remember in the Gospels where we read um, uh, seek the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Um, this is paralleled in both um, Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. It's not in Mark. Well, in Matthew's gospel, it says that the Father will give you every good gift. In Luke's gospel, it doesn't say every good gift. It says the Holy Spirit, which is the greatest gift that God could give. Events like that that help us when we put side by side Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, we see that Matthew is um, not, or I'm sorry, we see that Luke is trying to emphasize the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you read the baptism story of Jesus, Luke's is the only one that speaks of the Holy Spirit um, whisking Jesus away and being that dove. Um, the other have the dove, but they don't identify it like Luke does. So the role of the Holy Spirit is very important in Luke's gospel, and we're going to see that in Acts as well. The role of prayer is significant, more significant in Luke's gospel than the other two gospels. So when we read Acts and you see speech of prayer over and over and over again, you, you have to remember this is Luke the author writing, and that's one of his main concerns, one of his emphasis points in his gospel. So when we find that again in Acts, we need to kind of slow down and say, Luke is trying to tell us something when we read about prayer here. So that is the, the vertical thinking. Sounds a little bit like, uh, what do you mean by all that, Andy, right? Like, how do I, how do I apply that? Well, let me give you uh, an example. The first is in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 to, through 25, the Samaritans and Simon Magus, and then continuing on through verse 39. And let me just take a minute and actually read this section of Acts. And as I do, try to think to yourself, what kind of questions have I heard people try to answer out of this section of Acts? Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was one man, there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was something great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, ding, 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 right, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are all in gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken of the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And 
And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. So what are some of the things that um, questions have you heard asked of this passage? Like, have you ever heard somebody talk about, was Simon really saved? Or can a person lose their salvation? Perhaps that's a question you might ask of this passage, looking at Simon. Or, or you might ask yourself, when does a person receive the Holy Spirit? Is it at their conversion? Or does it happen later at the laying on of hands when somebody prays for you? Is there a second baptism? Is that a question you've heard asked about this passage? Should we practice today the laying out of hands to baptize a person in the Holy Spirit? Sometimes that's a question asked, and this is the passage that they go to to talk about. How should we understand a person, or how should, how should a person understand, um, how much should you understand before you're baptized? How much did the eunuch understand? How old should a person be before they're baptized? How much, have you heard, have you heard these questions asked of this passage? Can you, can you get the gospel if all you have is the Old Testament alone without somebody else to explain to you the New Testament? That's a question sometimes you ask, right? These are, these are questions we try to answer from these texts. The question is, are those questions that Paul was trying to answer when he wrote this narrative? Was Paul, I'm sorry, Luke, so I actually wrote Paul there in, in, instead of Luke. I wrote a paper one time on, uh, uh, while I was in grad school on the, the book of the Revelation. And the, the task was uh, the description of Jesus that happens in chapter 1. You know, his head's on fire and his feet are, you know, gold and all. You know, what was the background to that? What would the first audience have understood about that? And who do you think wrote, and I kept saying, Paul, 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 when I'm in my mind, I know it's John, John, John. And so the professor writes back, he's like, that's an interesting theory that Paul wrote Revelation. I'm like, who would say that? That's dumb. I open up my paper and there it was. I'm like, well, I did that because I'm an idiot. So strike Paul, put Luke there. What was, what was Luke's emphasis? Was Luke trying to tell us when the Holy Spirit comes? Was Luke trying to talk to us about the significance of baptism, or how much you should know before you get baptized? Was that Luke's objective? Well, this just so happens to be in the section of Acts where we've now moved out from Jerusalem into all of Samaria. Samaritans were ritually unclean. Eunuchs were ritually unclean. We know Luke's emphasis is on the outcast from his gospel, so what's Luke trying to say? He's trying to say, hey, the, the word of God has moved out beyond just the Jews. It's moved past Jerusalem. It's gone so far as the outcast that's ritually unclean, the Samaritans whom you hate, the Jewish Jew guy, Peter, 
He went up there, and he was the one who brought the Holy Spirit to the Samaritans. He's actually going to be the guy that brings the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles at, uh, at Cornelius' house. See, Luke's not trying to answer the questions we're trying to ask of the text. We do this in our regular lives too. I, I always wear nice socks, right? Wanda Dameron bought me some wonderful socks. I had two cans, two cans. You know, the bird with the, the fruit loops, right? They were like teal. Now, I could ask her, did you buy me these socks with the toucan on them because you think I'm a Fruit Loop? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> or the truth of the matter is, is that Wanda is a very loving person who's always thinking about other people. And when she saw those, she thought about me. And she wanted to bless me with a gift. And so if I read into that, things that she wasn't intending... I'm not getting the gift from her, just like we won't get out of Acts if we ask the wrong questions of the text. This shirt I wore today because it makes a good illustration. Um, somebody asked, is that a dogwood? I don't know. When I was in Hawaii for my daughter's 16th birthday, we went to the flea market. You can get a shirt like this for five bucks, or you can get five of them for 20 bucks. This was the fifth shirt. That's it. Didn't mean anything else. It just happened to be that. But you can ask these questions. Did you pick that up because of the colors? Or, but no, it was one, two, three. It was my size. And I was going to save, you know, two bucks a shirt if I got an extra shirt or whatever the maths works out to be, right? Save five bucks, a dollar a shirt. That's, that's it. So when we try to go to Acts and we ask these questions, and we're going to miss the point that Luke was trying to do. He was, he was emphasizing that the blessing of salvation has moved even to the outcast. He was trying to emphasize the importance of prayer before you go and witness to somebody. He was trying to emphasize that salvation is not something that happens by works such as baptism, but rather it's a free gift of the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans didn't get the Holy Spirit when they were baptized. We didn't read whether the Holy Spirit fell upon the eunuch or not. There, there isn't a, a connection there. Luke is saying this is God's work. This is the main point Luke is making. So our application today when we look at this has to fall in line with what Luke's was. Our question today should be who are the Samaritans and the eunuchs of today? Who are the outcasts of today? The, the drug addicts, the, the homeless, the um, AIDS victims, the, the babies that are um, born with drug addiction and their mothers, the, the children who don't have fathers and end up uh, moving into crime. These are the outcasts of today that Luke's emphasis is trying to tell us those are the people for whom God's Holy Spirit is available and salvation is also available. You and I may look at them as outcasts, but Christ wants us to go to them, just like he went from Jerusalem to Judea to all the world. And we should do that in prayer and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Which brings up the next point. This is a new covenant narrative. So when we are reading this book, we get to participate or imagine ourselves in the situation differently than we read the Old Testament. When we read Old Testament narrative, we don't ever think to ourselves, I'm going to go to the temple with my sheep and have the priest slaughter it and pour its blood on the altar, right? I hope you don't think that you're raising sheep to go to fly to Israel to do this. We don't think... Like when we read the, the narratives in the Gospels about walking on water, that we're going to see Jesus while we're out fishing come traipsing down the Jackson, well, don't fish in the Jackson, uh, what, maybe the Cow Pasture River, or that when you're fishing in a clean river, you're going to see Jesus come walking out to you and you're going to step out literally on that boat, right? We don't. 
we know that that is a story with a date that is expired. But when we read Acts, we are in the same time period, the same dispensation, the same period of salvation as they were. And so we can see ourselves walking in their shoes. We also know that the Holy Spirit that was available to them is just as available to us today. Instead of the Holy Spirit kind of coming upon a person to empower them as a prophet or an artist to cut stone or sew together fabric for the temple, um, the Holy Spirit resides in us, not just in the temple, in the holiest of holies. That's significant as we read how the people act in Acts and how we should act. We also need to recognize that this was a time period, though, of transition in between the covenants. So we begin, as we read Acts, understanding that the Holy Spirit has indwelt us and the law has been written on our hearts and that that brings both freedom and empowerment, but it also brings accountability. So uh, as we read this, we, we recognize there's a period of transition. In Acts chapter 21, Luke writes about Paul making ritual sacrifices in the temple. Are we to understand that we're supposed to do that because Paul did that? It's not trying to tell us that Paul was merging the covenants. It's not trying to tell us that Paul was trying to stay Jewish. We saw that in the book of Acts, there were, there were conferences that gathered together asking this question. Does a Gentile have to first become a Jew to then be a Christian? This is the theological narrative of how that covenant transition occurred in practice. It wasn't like overnight. Remember, Peter, when he was in Galatia, was eating regular food. He wasn't keeping the kosher laws. But when a, when a group of Jewish guys came to visit him from Jerusalem, he decided, well, I better not continue on eating this meat that was offered to idols and drinking this wine and all that. He said, I got to go back to my Jewish kosher laws. And Paul heard about this and he says, you hypocrite. You're either in Christ or not in Christ. You can't wiffle waffle back and forth like that and opposed him to his face for what Peter was doing. This was a hard transition. They, they had thousands of years of being Jewish. We have a couple hundred years of being Americans and the America of today is not much like the America of 50 years ago or 60 years ago, yet alone 250 years ago. They practiced their same rituals over and over again. Their culture was very stable. So it was a hard transition, and we read about that as we read about Acts, or as we read the, the events unfold in Acts. And so we need to respect that time, that transition that happened. Instead of trying to be more Jew-like, this was a new covenant, the way we relate to God is different. And we need to read this with the same rules that we applied to, to all narrative. We need to pay attention, put on our, our, our detail cap, like our Sherlock Holmes investigation. What does it mean, then, uh, to understand the, the, the purpose of Acts? Well, this is a narrative. And narrative teaches implicitly. Okay, what does it mean that narrative teaches in implicitly? It means that unless Scripture explicitly tells us that we must do something, what is only narrated or described does not function in a normative way unless it can be demonstrated on other grounds that the author intended it to function this way. Luke is telling theological narrative. He's not trying to prescribe, in most cases, 
what happens. And this, this gets into culture, into church culture especially. There are churches that won't put drums or guitars in their building because they see that in the New Testament, they didn't worship with drums or guitars. And they say, this is the new way you're supposed to worship. The truth is, it was illegal to be a Christian at the time Acts was written. They wouldn't just kill you. They would hang you on a cross on the main road, heading out of town, put something above that said pagan, well, Christian. You didn't worship their gods. So if when you gathered together, you broke out the 70 trombones, they might find you like that. (laughs) Of course they didn't play music. They had to make disciples. And you can't do that when you're advertising a big flashing sign, you know, Christian church, first Christian church of Rome this way, right? The Roman guards would show up and you're not going to, you, I mean, you'd be martyred and you'd be the last person you made a disciple of and the church would stop spreading. We see this today when we have restricted access countries that missionaries go to. Places where it's illegal to proclaim the name of Christ openly. They don't put up big steeples. They meet in people's homes. They, they sing softly. They don't break out the band. This wasn't something that, that should surprise us to find this, and we shouldn't take it on as, as practice. Here, here's one maybe a little closer to home. Uh, every instance of baptism... Here, that happens in Acts is of a person who became a believer or they were in their household and after having heard the gospel, they were baptized. So it seems like, I believe in believer's baptism. Okay, let me, let me put that, I think that's right. But I don't think that's right because of what we read in Acts. Because what we don't have in Acts is a description of a child who's born to a Christian family who then grows up being taught from that family and is later baptized. What we actually do is not actually described. Every event of baptism in Acts is an event of baptism to a missionary type event. The first time I'm hearing this gospel. The closest we come in all the New Testament is reading about Timothy whose mother and grandmother taught him the scripture. We don't know if he was even ever baptized by scripture. It's not in there. Now, we think he was because we believe it's prescribed for believers, but we believe that on different grounds than just acts. It's a good example, but it's not definitive. You can't hang your hat on it because the the thing we actually do is not actually in Acts. We don't know if there were families in Acts who baptized their babies just like babies were circumcised. We do know that by about 70 or 80 years after Jesus had died, the church was practicing infant baptism. We know this because the early church fathers wrote against infant baptism and said you should only baptize believers. But that wasn't what was happening. And, and it made sense for their time because you'd have to have 10 kids to have one make it to adulthood. And they believed baptism was important. So when you had your baby whose umbilical cord was wrapped around its neck, you knew it was only going to live a, a few minutes. They'd baptize that baby right there because they thought it was a ritual that was important. And so it became a practice. So if we're going to argue for uh, baptism out of Acts, we have to have other grounds, other theological grounds, which we do. What about church governance? This is interesting because uh, we are in a congregationalist type church. We believe that the Bible teaches the authority of the church resides in the members of the church. Not in the pastor, not in the elders, but that Christ is the head of the church. He's empowered the church 
to choose for itself pastors and teachers, what we call elders or pastors. And we get that example shown to us in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, as the congregation chose deacons. See, but there's a whole other form of church government called Presbyterianism. You all ever heard of that? They have a, a church government where the pastor of the church um, goes to a conference of presbyters, and, and the church overall has a hierarchy, a conference of people that gather. Well, we see something like that in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Episcopalians and Roman Catholics believe the church has a single head on earth, the Archbishop of Canterbury for the Church of England, the Pope for the Roman Catholics. We see something similar to that in Acts, in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38. And so when, you, when Presbyterians and Episcopalian forms of church government want to defend their form of church government, they can look to passages in Acts that represent what they practice. So is it Luke describing? Is he giving examples of what's normal? Or is he prescribing, prescribing how it should be? He's only telling you what happened. We have to use wisdom and, and other theological grounds unless it's specifically taught. They may, they, these passages might act as a support uh, for our church government, but they don't, just, they don't prescribe how we should do it. What about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and charismatic type gifts like speaking in tongues or prophecy? Well, baptism in the Spirit is found, those words are found twice in Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 5 and in chapter 11 verse 16. And in the New Testament we find baptism in the Spirit five other times. Four in the Gospels when um, John the Baptist talks about the one who comes after me is greater than me. I baptize in water, but he will baptize in the Spirit. And then one time we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, where Paul is using that as an example of church unity, for we were all baptized into one spirit. So, what does it mean to be baptized in the spirit if in Acts it's only twice? Is that um, something that's indicated by charismatic gifts? Well, there are three specific instances. Let's just take speaking in tongues in Acts. Chapter 2, verse 4 at Pentecost. Chapter 10, verse 46, and chapter 19, verse 6. And I think in the passage that we read with Simon the Magus, Simon Magus, I think that was an example of speaking in tongues as well. The reason I say that is because they were performing miracles and healings before the Holy Spirit had fallen, before they had received the Holy Spirit. But then when Peter and the other apostles came up and prayed and laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and Simon saw that the Holy Spirit had fallen on them. And he asked, can I buy this power from you? So that when, well, what did he see that was different than healings? What did he see that was different than miracles that would indicate the Holy Spirit had fallen? I think it was probably prophecy and speaking in tongues. But Luke doesn't tell us that specifically. Anyhow, three times in Acts, and every single time that we see speaking in tongues, we see this as a movement in Acts where the gospel goes out to new people. Just like Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22, where he said, quoting from Isaiah 28, that people of a foreign language, of a foreign tongue, will speak, and this will be a sign of, of missing the Messiah, of judgment to you. And that's exactly what Luke shows in all three instances. First in Jerusalem, then in Judea, and then to all the peoples of the world. So if we're going to read this uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit accompanied by charismatic gifts, it doesn't match with the testimony of Acts as far as being normative. And there's good theological reason outside of Acts to say it's not normative because Paul says, not everybody is given the gift of speaking of tongues. So it can't be describing 
what's going to happen when you receive it. It can't be normative of what's going to happen. And it's certainly not prescribing this. This is just how Paul, or Luke rather, is moving the story forward, showing that the gospel has moved outside of Jerusalem to the outcast, showing his emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit, showing his emphasis on prayer. So how then are we to read Acts? Well, the first thing we do is we situate what we're reading in the the timeline of that story. Where is the gospel going? To whom are they going? The next thing we do is we recognize Luke is the author and we think vertically. What are Luke's emphasis points? What is Luke concerned about. The third thing we do is we say, is this a practice that was being prescribed to the church? Or was Luke describing and using the description to move the story along rather than try to give us details about what we should do? And this is not easy. This is hard. It really is. And that's why we read the Bible together in community. That's why we take our ideas and we, we, as iron sharpen iron, so one man sharpens another, the proverb says. This is, this is why God blessed some as teachers, right? This is why God blessed some as prayer warriors. Some people are just pure academics, and they're boring to listen to. I don't know those people. And we have about 10 minutes for questions. End of show, everybody's favorite slide. It's a short one. All right, well, I think we can go off air then. And uh, thank you for joining us.